Good morning, Your Excellency Governor of West Bengal, Mr. Sharma, Mr. Goenka, our host, Mr. Purkhasta, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here and a special pleasure because I had the, you might say, honor and the privilege of being at the first Infocom and I'm indeed pleased to see that this effort is continuing and as Mr. Sharma just said, growing from year to year. I think it's been a seminal thing for the whole Eastern region and is becoming more and more national. And today when I look at the galaxy of speakers that are there, I'm indeed impressed. I'm particularly happy that apart from my good friends and colleagues from the IT industry, uh, Infocom this year also features a whole diverse range of leaders coming from different areas. And nothing could be more appropriate in the context of the topic, which is entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurship, and those of you who heard Mr. Chandrasekharan a few minutes ago would recall what he said in terms of diversity. It has to come from various sides, places, thoughts. And I want to focus a little bit on that whole aspect of entre entrepreneurship, which is inextricably linked with innovation. And that's where I want to just focus a few thoughts as we go ahead today. And when I look at entrepreneurship and the possibilities today, it's indeed exciting. And in many, many ways, for more reasons than one, I envy the young people today. When I was growing up, as were many of you in this audience, and certainly those who were here, the opportunities for entrepreneurship were very limited. It was very difficult to get business going. You needed a lot of money, you needed to invest, you needed to take the risk, and it became very difficult to navigate even the difficulties of getting permissions, approvals, and so on. Today, that has radically changed. The entrepreneurial opportunities are across the board, and especially in the area of technology more than others, what you need to bring is not so much capital as intellectual capital. So you don't need as much money as intellectual capital, and that is enough. And that is what has created what you might call a virtual revolution in what has happened in this country. If you look particularly at the IT industry, you will see that the industry is even today, barring one or two very large companies, dominated by first generation entrepreneurs, who is brought into their companies when they set it up, mainly and often only intellectual capital. And I don't have to name these companies, the most visible, the most famous, the most written about, of course, is Infosys. And you all know what it started on with a few thousand rupees, but a lot of intellectual capital. So those who are young today have the opportunity now of bringing to bear this kind of thing, whether or not they have backing, money, and wealth. But they need something else, though. And what, what I have as I summarized at the 5F formula, without those 5Fs, those of you who are aspiring entrepreneurs, don't think about it. That's my advice to you. First, you need focus, you need an idea, you need thought, you need to know what you're doing. Second, you need fire, fire in the belly. You need passion, you need to want to do this and need to want to make it successful. Third, you need to think it's fun. And again, this was touched on in some of the discussions this morning. You need to think that this is something I want to do, this is something I enjoy doing. But you also need two factors from the ecosystem. One is money, you need funding. Mr. Sharma mentioned how the government is looking at schemes to do some of this. But there are also a large number, fortunately, and again, that's why I come back to envying the young today, even when they need a little money, there are a large number of angel investors, VC funds at a later stage, and at an even later stage, PE funds, who are willing to put in money just on the basis of something which you can show them and talk to them about. In fact, many are willing to put in money just on the basis of an idea. You just go with an idea, not even a proof of concept, saying, I've got this very bright idea. And there are people today who will say, fine, I'll give you a little money, go build me a proof of concept, even before you build a business plan. So there is money. But you also need some facilities. And here I address myself to institutions and the government. I think we need to create that facilities to facilitate entrepreneurship. What does a young entrepreneur need in the tech space? He needs a place. He needs internet connectivity. He needs a little bit of computers. He needs some amount of ability to get on with the outside world and get his business going. These kinds of very simple facilities are required. If you're moving to the hardware space, what you need is some ability to get to a test laboratory. You can't invest in test equipment, it's expensive. So can you go to a laboratory somewhere and test what you've done, check it out, see that it meets whatever specs are there. And these are the facilities with institutions, be they academic institutions, some of which are providing these, be they research laboratories of the government, some of which are beginning to slowly throw open their facilities for such outside people, though on a charge, or be there the government itself, it can facilitate some so-called incubation centers or facilities of this type. 
So I think there are huge opportunities. All this is happening and the entrepreneurs can take heart to go ahead with this. There are also phenomenal opportunities because of technological changes. Mr. Sharma mentioned some of them and I want to just reiterate that. The confluence that's happening between mobile technology and its tremendous growth, the apps you can have on it and what you can do on it, with the fact that we have a UID platform to which Mr. Sharma himself has been the big and major contributor in creating that, which has already 700 million and will very soon in a few months touch a billion. You have that platform and then you have the cloud, which makes it so easy to get infrastructure, software, anything you want on a paper use basis. You don't have to invest in that. The confluence of these three, I think, creates opportunities which never existed before. And that is going to drive a lot of growth if you look at what opportunities there are. But there are also some pitfalls and there are two things in particular which you've got to watch for. One is within you and your immediate environment, which is your family, your friends. That is what you might call fear of failure. We talked this morning a little bit about risk averseness. I think Mr. Purkast asked that question and it's true. That risk averseness comes not from within so much as from saying, if I don't succeed, what will my family say? What will my friends say? What will my neighbors say? And then many times those who advise you, maybe with good reason, tell you, be careful. You've got a good job, why do you want to take a chance and start something on your own? So there is this fear of failure which you have to overcome. And there is a risk. Obviously there is a risk. I don't think it can be minimized. And that's what differentiates a true entrepreneur from somebody who's not willing to do it. A true entrepreneur will want to take that risk. Yes, he needs support and I think we need to create a social climate where this is done. The best example is the US, where as they say, it's not just an allegorical story, it's true that if you go to an angel investor and he asks you, what's your idea and you give him your idea, it's a very good idea, have you started something before and you say no, he will be a bit doubtful about funding you. But if the same person goes to him and says, I've got this very bright idea and he asks you, have you tried out something before? Have you did? And you say, yes, I tried four times before and every time I failed. He will say, great, here's the money. Because the understanding there is that if you have tried and failed and gone again, it means one, you're truly an entrepreneur. Number two, you have learned a great deal from your failures and now you won't repeat that same mistake again. I think we need to build that kind of climate. But there's also a broader environmental cultural factor which dominates our society and hopefully it will change. And that is the freedom. And again, there was some mention of it in some of the talks earlier. And that's the freedom to think differently, to come out with a bright idea, to think out of the box. And despite all the constraints which have been talked about time and again, I've spoken of them endlessly, a very structured, hierarchical social system or school system where you keep your you know, mouth very tightly shut but your ears and eyes open. Despite all that, we are great creators. After all, who else could have created a missed call as an innovative way of making a free transaction without paying any money. You know, we are the ones who do all these kinds of things. I can give you 10 other examples where we are able to beat the system by innovating in some way. But there is this concern that we must be able to think freely. And the feudalism in our society must tend to enable that. Feudalism is orders from above, the very contrast, contrary to freedom and what you need to do. Feudalism also means don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't wear these clothes, you can't dress like this, you can't go here, you can't go there. If that continues, we are sunk. Fortunately, I don't think that's where our society is going. I don't think that's where people are. But I do think that if we want to be an innovative entrepreneurial society, we need that freedom to be able to dissent, to think differently, to come out with new ideas. This is a must if you want to innovate. That's reality. You like it or not, whatever values you have. Just a couple of other comments before I close this part. You know, entrepreneurship is not all about starting a new company. Some of it Mr. Chandrasekharan mentioned this again this morning, is entrepreneurship within companies, what has been called intrapreneurship. You can be in a large organization and yet do something very creative if the organization structure is geared to that. And you can do exciting new things because often entrepreneurship does require a lot of support on a broader basis and so there are possibilities there. But the other one that excites me more is entrepreneurship in the social domain. Can you create things that are socially useful and if you make some money very good, that's good. But think not just of a product, but think of services. And to me, the most exciting possibility, which is so obvious and I wish somebody would do this, is look at a Google. You know, all of us use Google. They have invested huge amounts, billions of dollars in R&D for their search algorithms, getting everything together, helping you just type in a word and give you everything about it. Do you pay for it? No, you don't. It's free. 
Fantastic model. They make money. Don't worry, Google makes enough money. The market capitalization is huge, their profits are huge. So what is it about this? A phenomenal business model, isn't it? The user doesn't pay and yet the person who's done all the work and all the R&D makes enough money. Can we somehow create this, a very creative business model of this type for our social issues, for the needs of this country? Can we somehow provide the best quality education and health, just as Google provides you the best quality search to our people without the user paying for it? Think about it, it's a thought from which you can divert, divert to many others where entrepreneurs might want to think about how can you create products, services and whole things which are needed in this country for those who are not so well off, where you make your money but the user doesn't pay. Final words, I started with Infocom and I want to end on that note. You know, this, as I said, is becoming a national event. But it's terribly important for this part of the country, for Calcutta and West Bengal in particular, with the whole eastern region. And I think there is tremendous scope here, which has not been used. Tremendous amount of talent in this city, in this state, and the whole eastern region which is not being tapped. As Mr. Sharma mentioned, they are all migrating to other places. Why not a big center here? Calcutta has evolved, it has become a center, but I am maybe greedy, maybe I am ambitious, I don't think it has reached where it should or where it can. And why is that? I think we need to think about it. We need to see how more companies can be brought here, how more entrepreneurs, most importantly, can be created here. But we also need to introspect collectively and maybe within the government, but what is it that is not attracting more people to this otherwise fantastic definition, destination which has talent which has capability, which is well connected, where costs are lower, it has everything going for it. So what is it that is not happening? Just a thought for each one of us individually, but certainly I would also like to address myself to the government and say for many years as I've been saying, please look at what needs to be done. You're competing. You're not starting on a clean slate. You can't say that I provide what Bangalore does because Bangalore is way ahead of you. You can't say I do what Hyderabad does because Hyderabad is way ahead of you. You need to do something here. And you need to understand that the IT service industry alone is set to double in the next five years. So there is that huge opportunity for places to come to, for jobs to be created, for wealth to be created. There is a huge and in fact as much or a bigger opportunity in electronics hardware because nothing exists. Calcutta and West Bengal has been the industrial hub of the country for decades and decades before it went away. That DNA has not gone from this place. This is yet an engineering industrial culture. Can you bring manufacturing to this place and be the number one in manufacturing for electronics just as Bangalore is number one for IT software and services? What stops Calcutta from doing that? I think there are great possibilities. I think it's very exciting. We need young entrepreneurs to think of this. We also need to try and see what can be brought in here. And I think it's a collective effort to see how can we create the broader ecosystem in terms of what the government needs to do, what organizations need to do, and what individual entrepreneurs need to do so that this place can take off and really reach the potential which it doubtless has. Thank you.